Hey, what's up you guys? It's Bloody Jacob here to bring you my weekly review of Penny Dreadful. This week's episode is entitled Verbis Diablo. And, uh, wow guys, this show, um, has to be one of my favorites on TV right now. It's still currently airing. And this show just continues to impress me every episode. Um, I love season one, and if you guys seen my review of the season two premiere, Fresh Hell, which was actually put online, uh, officially available, you know, back in uh, April. If you guys seen that review, you can you would see any how of uh, how uh, ecstatic I was about the show going into this season. And even with the whole witches thing going on, I'm actually pretty intrigued by that. I still am. And uh, yeah, so I had to, um, you know, renew my subscription to Showtime. Because I really just have to watch this when it airs. It deserves it. It's that good of a show. And I'm honestly more excited about Penny Dreadful this season than I am about Game of Thrones, to be completely honest. Um, I just feel like Penny Dreadful is a better show to me. That's just my opinion. I'll still be watching Game of Thrones, though. I'll be watching it online. But Penny Dreadful has now taken priority over Game of Thrones as far as uh, when my reviews come up. So uh, both have new episodes tomorrow night. I'll be watching Penny Dreadful and then probably uh, Game of Thrones the next day. So my Penny Dreadful reviews will probably come before my Game of Thrones stuff now. But you can still try to count on both of them. And this week's episode was another, this week's episode of Penny Dreadful, Vervis Diablo was another great uh, builder for the season. And you see with Game of Thrones this season, you know, they've, they've been really slower than usual with their pace. I understand it's a slow burn, but you know, this episode of Penny Dreadful is slower, but they still really built on things and had, you know, more important things happen in the plot and stuff like that, which I was really excited about. And, damn, it's hot right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably one of the hottest days we've had so far in Michigan. So, yeah, anyway, let's not get into that right now. Uh, let's see, there's just a lot of great things that happened. I mean, uh, Sir Malcolm ended up taking Vanessa down to a place where he finds a sort of a sense of peace when he goes there. And uh, we, we find out that is actually a form of a soup kitchen type of thing. And we find out that Sir Malcolm helps out down there periodically and he actually provides the, you know, the organization with uh, funding and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. And uh, so Vanessa starts helping out down there and we actually see her run into the creature, or uh, John Clare, as he's called now. And so it's good to finally see these two characters uh, interact and meet each other, because we didn't see that out of all of season one, I don't think. And they just had a really, really interesting conversation. You know, I said in my premiere, my review of the premiere, you know, what great writing the show has. You know, like it, the writing, the dialogue is really poetic and you know deep and has a lot of detail to it while still being able to you know be understandable to like the general audience and this was one of the best examples of that the conversation uh john clare and vanessa had here and you know, of course uh john clare or i'm just gonna call him the creature is always taken back when any human shows him any sort of acknowledgement or like positive like uh attitude you know what i mean because he always thinks he's automatically going to be rejected because that's just the way he was sort of like uh brought up and sort of like brought into the world you know used to all that and uh yeah sorry about that so i thought that interaction was really one of the highlights of the episode hence why i make it like the focus of my custom thumbnail i have here so that was really good in and of itself. I'm not going to try and repeat any lines I said to each other because I'm probably just going to butcher them. But you guys obviously know what scene I'm talking about if you watch the episode, of course. And uh, let's see. That ending, man. The ending of this episode is uh, pretty twisted uh, itself, too. But we'll get to that within a few minutes. I apologize for the shaking of my webcam. I'm going to try to fix that right now. I don't know. I don't know why it's shaking so much more than usual right now. I apologize for that. I'll try to keep my hand off the desktop. But, uh... We also spent some time with uh, Victor um, working on Brona Croft, or as she's now known uh, as Lily. No, not my girlfriend, Lily. 
I believe this Lily only has one L in her name anyway. But she is blonde too now, apparently. But, you know, of course, we all know it's Rona Croft. And uh, so Victor this week was sort of like working on teaching her language, sort of like getting her to sort of like let that come out of herself. You know, they're still not sure when the memory's going to start coming back to her. Because as they, uh, they bring up Proteus again from last season, um, you know, Victor sort of throws it in the creature's face how he killed Proteus, you know. But uh, the creature actually acknowledges that as one of his sins and that Victor shouldn't forget his. So, yeah, they're kind of on a more even playing field now than they were last season as far as how good they are as people goes. And so Victor was, you know, teaching her language and, you know, sort of, like, getting her used to the world and stuff like that. But at the same time, we saw that sort of, like, creepy vibe going on that Victor is actually interested in Rona or uh, Lily herself. And, I don't know, this is just a pretty bizarre love triangle we have going on here. Because I want the creature to feel like a sense of uh, belonging, like a sense of love that, you know, he never has, he has never really gotten. And so I want that for him. And it's going to be weird to see if... Uh, we're probably going to run into an issue here where uh, the creature eventually finds out about uh, Victor's interest in Brona or Lily, as she's known now. But then again, you know, Victor is sort of in a similar situation, too, because he doesn't look like he's had very much uh, love in his life either. You know, he seems to be a pretty secluded person and a pretty, uh, you know remove person from society as far as that goes so it's going to be interesting to see what they make of that and uh, of course Victor he also make, makes Brona or Lily look more alive you know, giving her that blonde hair that I talked about that you can sort of see in the thumbnail of my video and uh, yeah so it's going to be interesting to see where that goes and I'm sure we'll have another conflict once uh, Ethan eventually sees her again so that should be uh, kind of awkward but we'll see how that goes when the time comes and uh, we also have that inspector that we've seen in the premiere looking into the, you know, the slaughtering, you know, that Ethan's werewolf is responsible for. And we have that one survivor, you know, his face is completely messed up and stuff like that. And the doctor's not even sure if he's going to be able to speak again because of how much of his face is removed. But, you know, I'm sure the detective will probably, or inspector or whatever he is, will probably be able to get something out of him at some point, somehow. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that ends up uh, going into the rest of the story. Because as we've seen last week, um, we, we teased, uh, e they teased Ethan finding, ugh, they teased Ethan telling Vanessa about what he is, you know, sort of like peeing around the bush a little bit about it, you know, talking about how he blacks out, then it's dark, and then he wakes up and there's blood. But I'm sure Vanessa will find more, out more directly about what's actually going on at some point. And I think she'll support Ethan, you know, she'll try to help him. And it's going to be interesting to see the problems the detective um, causes when he, once he figures out who more you know who it is more likely. So we'll see where that goes. I like that, you know. So we kind of get like a spin on that classic uh, police looking into you know the werewolf story and stuff like that, sort of like in the Wolfman. So that's what it kind of reminds me of. And so that was good. Um, we also had uh, Evelyn Poole or Madame Kali you know, trying, basically trying to slowly seduce and manipulate Sir Malcolm. Because she was, she was uh, shown in season one, so their connection isn't completely new. So we already know uh, Sir Malcolm sort of probably feels a certain pull to her, you know. And, uh, you know, she ends up going with him to, like, the shooting range and stuff like that, and sort of, like, throwing off his aim, because he's usually pretty much dead on with the targeting. But when he tries to shoot this week, Evelyn uses her power to sort of, like, uh, screw with his mind a little bit, and he misses more than usual. And then she also has him smell all these different perfumes and figure out which one he likes on her the most. And then she has a special one that she has him sniff, and, you know, she ch does one of those chantings, and, you know, to him in his ear, and, you know, that sort of you know, puts more influence of her into him. So we're going to see how that goes. I'm hoping Sir Malcolm ends up figuring out what's going on eventually. I'm sure he will. But, yeah, I hope it goes fairly well, but probably won't <laughs> with the show. But, yeah, that is nonetheless, uh, you know, it's tense because we know what Evelyn Poole is. And, yeah, we're just worried for Sir Malcolm at this point. So you really feel like a sense of danger with this. And uh, one of Evelyn's daughters, or... I don't know if I want to call her daughters, or we'll say one of Evelyn's witches, 
Um, I forget how to pronounce her name. I don't want to butcher it. But you know the like the primary uh, witch, her like general in the field she has. Um, you know she basically stalks this couple. You know with this you know carrying around this baby. They go onto the subway, onto the train, and then she goes into that you know witch type of mode. And she just completely slaughters the husband and wife, you know, like, slits their throats within, like, a, a second. And so I thought that was pretty creepy with the lights flickering and stuff like that. It was, it was shot really well. As I mentioned in the premiere review, that's one of the best things about the show, too. Like, the visuals and the cinematography and stuff like that. It's incredible, man. And, you know, the way this was shot was really cool, too. And she takes the baby, okay? <laughs> and she brings him back you know, for uh, Evelyn, and we get a very bizarre stuff. We see this room full of dolls, and we don't know what's really going on yet, <laughs> but uh, we see Evelyn take the baby alone into her, uh, the special doll room she has, you know, with this, like, shelves, 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 shelves of these dolls, and she lays the baby down. I'm not sure if the baby is dead already or not, or maybe he had some like, kind of, like, spell on him, so he would be more quiet. I'm not sure. But nonetheless, she basically, like, tears into the baby and, you know, pulls out some of its intestines and its heart and then stitches it into this doll she's making. And the doll turns out to look and have a very strong resemblance to Vanessa, which is definitely no mere coincidence. Of course, that's what she was probably going for. And so we see this really, like, eerie shot of Vanessa standing and then, the, you know, it showing the doll. And so is this like a voodoo doll of some kind? I don't know. But I'm sure Evelyn will be using it as a way, as another more indirect, but yet powerful way to get to Vanessa. We'll, so we'll see how this all works. But, ugh. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> I really apologize. But anyway, um... Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are probably pretty uh, thrown off by what they do with the baby this week, but really, look at the genre the show is, and look at what kind of show it's supposed to be. And you really should, if you're not into the stuff as it is, you probably shouldn't be watching anyway, and if you can't handle the baby thing, I mean, come on. Yes, it's twisted, yes, it's dark, and we are not, I don't like seeing babies getting killed like that, or having their heart, you know, pulled out or anything like that. But, uh... You know, I can take it. I've seen things like this before. Although, not a baby very often, so it's pretty different for the show. But, yes, they probably did it for some shock value. You know, sort of like with the Dorian and Ethan kiss last season. That just came out of nowhere and hasn't been mentioned since. You know, so I feel like it's another thing they sort of did for the shock of it. But it also does, still does the whole baby thing tie in nicely to the story they're trying to tell here. So I feel like it's still relevant to the story, and it wasn't just done for uh, the sake of it happening in general, you know? So I feel like this whole baby thing and the doll thing is going to, you know, have a bigger picture and stuff like that. So I'm fine with it, but still it's pretty twisted, of course, to see a baby's heart and intestines pulled out, no question. So yeah, it was a pretty eerie ending, too. And, uh, yeah, so... It's pretty much all I have to say about this week's episode. I'm sure there's stuff I didn't mention, and if there is things I didn't mention that you really feel like talking about, feel free to leave a comment. We'd love to discuss it with you guys. And uh, yeah, Penny Dreadful, great, phenomenal show, one of my favorites at this point. Just incredible every single week, every single episode, and I'll definitely be reviewing the episode tomorrow night, and you know, I'll probably have that review out by Monday. So yeah, I'll catch you guys next time, and uh, peace.